Welcome back to the playlist on amino acid catabolism. Okay, what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at the mechanism of a transaminase. Okay, now in the direction that we're running, okay, we're going to look at the uh, alanine transaminase, but we're going to do it in the direction that goes in the biosynthesis of alanine. Okay. If you're catabolizing alanine, keep in mind what you're doing. If you're catabolizing alanine, you'd be going from alanine to what? To pyruvate, right? Um, in this direction, what we're going to find is we're going to go from pyruvate to alanine. Now, what, what's important to understand about the transaminase is, is if we're doing alanine transaminase in the direction of alanine synthesis, right? If we're going towards alanine, right? That means that we're going to require L-glutamate. So our net reaction is going to be glutamate, and specifically the L-isomer in humans. L-glutamate plus pyruvate, right, is going to go to alanine plus alpha-ketoglutarate. Okay, and if you've seen the videos up to this point, that should make sense. Okay, in the direction of alanine biosynthesis, we're going to require glutamate and pyruvate, and we should get out alpha ketoglutarate. And we note our, our L glutamate right here. This is our glutamate that comes into the active site. Now, at rest, um, before the mechanism actually starts, the glutamate is actually going to be forced to be in its alpha amine deprotonated state. So that means that the alpha amine is going to have this lone pair right here. And that lone pair is going to be what's catalytically active initially. Okay. Now, in general, there are going to be two um, things that are going to be catalytically active in the active site of the transaminase. One of them is this pyridoxal phosphate that's down here. Okay, This right here, and I'm going to circle it in green, this is pyridoxal phosphate, this down here. This is pyridoxal phosphate. And the pyridoxal phosphate at rest, before the mechanism starts, is tied up in a shift base linkage to a lysine in the active site. And we're effectively going to eliminate lysine. And once we eliminate it, the lysine is also going to be the other catalytically active part of the active site. So the only two catalytically active things directly are going to be a lysine residue, which is the one you see here, and the pyridoxal phosphate. Okay? There are other residues in the active site, certainly, but all they're doing is they're basically um, bystanders that are stabilizing the pyridoxal phosphate and other things in the active site. Okay, So without boring you any further, let's actually look at the mechanism. Now, actually, one thing I do want to do first is um, let's say that instead, let's say that instead of doing this direction, you're going the opposite direction. So you start with alanine, right? plus alpha-ketoglutarate, of course, and that would be going in the direction of L-glutamate, right, plus pyruvate, okay? What you need to be aware of for these mechanisms is they're identical, okay? So if you were going to do that, you would basically take this group right here, and you'd call that your R group, right? That's R, right? So basically, in the direction we're running in this video, our R group is just, is just a propionate group. That's part of glutamate, right? It's R group is a propionate group. But if you were running in the other direction, which is alanine catabolism, you would just replace that with a methyl group, right? Because alanine's R group is a methyl group. In this direction, let me do this in red because I did that before. In this direction, we're going to require pyruvate, right? We're going to require pyruvate. Well, that's our alpha keto acid. But basically what we can say is this group right here, which is a methyl group, okay? That's our R prime, right? And that will become alanine. Now, if we're running in the other direction, which I did in purple, um, our alpha ketoglutarate plus alanine goes to glutamate and pyruvate. This R group, not R prime, but R, that would be a methyl group, whereas our R prime, because it requires alpha ketoglutarate, would be a propionate. And I hope that makes sense. Mechanistically, though, these are going to be identical, so just bear that in mind, okay? They're identical, okay? All you do is replace those groups with different groups. Okay. Now the first step in the mechanism, and I'll do these steps in yellow, is going to be nucleophilic attack of this nitrogen of the alpha amine of glutamate on the shift base carbon, which is activated between the lysine and the pyridoxal phosphate. That's going to force a proton transfer from the alpha amine and you end up generating another lone pair on the nitrogen. And this the, this bond right here between the hydrogen and the nitrogen right there, that's this lone pair right here. Okay, And because we're going to eliminate um, the lysine in two steps, because it's a two-step 
uh, mechanism. It's not bimolecular, okay? It's actually a unimolecular elimination, okay? So what's going to happen now is this lone pair is going to kick back in here and perform the elimination, okay? And that's going to kick off the lysine residue in the deprotonated form. So what we have to understand right now is the lysine is in the deprotonated form, and that's what's going to initiate the catalysis, okay? And also keep in mind now that what was the glutamate is now in a shift base linkage to the pyridoxal phosphate, okay? Now, in this step of the mechanism, what's going to happen is we're going to deprotonate the alpha carbon of glutamate. So this lone pair is going to come here and attack this proton, and what that's going to do is force the formation of something called a quinonoid intermediate. Okay, so let's actually look at the electron pushing right now. So you form a, a double bond there. This bond comes in here to form the double bond, and you get another rearrangement here in the pyridoxal phosphate ring. Okay, and this structure right here, okay, let me, let me do it like this. This structure right here, okay, this is called the quinonoid intermediate, okay? It's called quinonoid because it's similar to that of a quinone. If you were to look at a quinone, it looks like this, okay? This is a quinone. Notice how in a quinone, you have a double bond right here, which is a carbonyl, and you would normally have another carbonyl there, and two double bonds right here. Okay, so you can, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it, it's similar enough to where they call it a quinonoid. And when you hear oid as the suffix on a word, oftentimes what that means is that it's similar to, but not the same thing as. Okay, so it's not a quinone, certainly, but it's similar to it. But it's essentially what it is, it's, it's the quinone version of, um, it's the quinone version of a pyridine ring, okay, where you have a double bond on the top, okay. So now what's going to happen is this intermediate, this quinone intermediate, is going to collapse. And it's going to funnel these electrons back out, and it's going to cause the deprotonation of lysine. So these electrons will come over here and abstract the proton from lysine. Now, why is this pyridoxal phosphate used here? Well, um, the nitrogen of the pyridoxal phosphate is what's referred to as an electron sink. Let me write that down because that's really important. This nitrogen is called an electron sink. If you think about what a sink does, um, it has a drain that just accepts all the water, right? You, you turn on the sink, you turn on the faucet, and the water comes out, but the water just gets abstracted by the drain, right? The hole in the sink, right? That's why the, um, the pyridoxal, pyridoxal phosphate is called an electron sink. Whenever you have the quinonoid intermediate formed, these electrons, and let me show you which electrons I'm talking about, these ones right here, the ones I circled in orange, those pi electrons can be um, accepted by that nitrogen of the pyridine ring, okay? It's sort of like the analog of the sink. The sink drain is accepting the water, just like that nitrogen of the pyridine ring is accept accepting those pi electrons. So because that nitrogen is an excellent electron acceptor, especially when you have conjugation involved, it's called an electron sink, okay? And that's very important. We'll see that in other areas of metabolism as well okay now the electron sink is going to donate its electrons back to reform aromaticity and like I said what's going to happen is these pi electrons right here are going to deprotonate lysine regenerating deprotonated lysine and now what you have is pyridoxal phosphate regenerated but it's no longer in a shift base linkage so notice what's happened we've, ge we've regenerated aromaticity in the pyridine ring okay but the shift base is now between the alpha carbon right here. It's between this alpha carbon and the nitrogen right here that was the alpha amine. So this is where our shift base is now. Now keep in mind that shift base carbons are especially activated when the nitrogen of the shift base is protonated and when it has a positive charge. Okay, That especially makes... Um, shift base carbons activated. And so what's going to happen is the lysine is going to deprotonate water. And when it deprotonates water, it's going to facilitate the nucleophilic addition of the water across that shift base carbon. So this is going to come here and attack the alpha carbon, and that forces uh, these electrons onto the nitrogen. Okay, so what this step effectively was, was that it was an addition reaction or a hydration of a shift base carbon. Okay, and we note that um, we have a hydroxyl group added here. Um, you can effectively think of it the same way as an addition reaction 
of an alkene that you saw probably in organic one or early in organic two. It's effectively the same thing except for the fact that the nitrogen again is acting as an electron sink. It's not as powerful as an electron sink as the pyridoxal phosphate pyridine ring, but it's still an electron sink. When that hydroxyl group attacks, um, the electrons can be accepted by the nitrogen. And that's the beauty of shift bases, is the carbon's activated, but as soon as something attacks it, the electrons that are part of the double bond, those pi electrons can be accepted by the nitrogen, and that's what's, uh, that's what's uh, useful about them, okay? Then what's going to happen is this amine right here is going to deprotonate the hydroxyl group, forcing the formation of a carbonyl, right? And specifically, this is going to be the alpha keto group, okay? And then that forces this amine as the leaving group, okay? So that nitrogen gets lost as the leaving group. And so now what you have is the amine version of pyridoxal phosphate. So this is the amine right here of pyridoxal phosphate, okay? And notice what we generate, okay? we generated alpha-ketoglutarate. So this molecule right here, this is alpha-ketoglutarate. And just bear in mind that if we were running this in the direction of alanine catabolism, uh, we would have started with alanine, right? And this group would have been a methyl group because we would have spit off pyruvate, right? So you would just basically change the identity of that R group, okay? But in this direction of starting with glutamate, we get alpha-ketoglutarate out. So now what's going to happen is this amine that's on the pyridoxal phosphate, okay, it's going to do a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon of the ketone group of pyruvate. And that's going to force these pi electrons to come out and abstract the proton from this amine and, and it's going to generate a lone pair on the nitrogen, okay. And keep in mind, we still have a protonated lysine in the active site, and that, that came from the step when we deprotonated water. So the proton that we're going to abstract next, that's from the water molecule that ultimately did the um, nucleophilic addition on um, this part right here. Okay. So now, so now what's going to happen is we're going to have an elimination. So we're going to form a shift base. These, this lone pair is going to come in here and form a shift base, and we're going to lose water. And in the process, the hydroxyl leaves, and as it does, it abstracts the proton from the lysine, regenerating the um, deprotonated form of lysine. And, and now we have a shift base linkage, um, and that will ultimately be what forms alanine. Okay, so the next step in the mechanism is going to be the formation of another quinonoid intermediate. Okay, so in all of these transamination reactions, if you're expected to draw the mechanism, you should always expect to see two quinonoid intermediates. And keep in mind that this nitrogen right here, let me do this in green, this nitrogen is acting as an electron sink. The reason it can do that is because it's a good electron acceptor. Remember, when you have a shift base, um, which technically the pyridine ring is a shift base, okay? Whenever the carbon gets attacked, okay, and specifically we're attacking this carbon right here, okay, this is the carbon that gets attacked, the one I highlighted in yellow. When that carbon gets attacked, those pi electrons can be accepted by that nitrogen. That's what makes it an electron sink. So this lone pair on the amine of lysine is going to deprotonate this carbon right here, and that's going to force a double bond rearrangement, and of course, we're going to get um, this nitrogen acting as an electron sink, and we end up forming the quinonoid intermediate, and that's what we see right here. That's the quinonoid intermediate. Okay, now keep in mind, at this point, now we have our protonated lysine. As you can quickly see through this mechanism, um, pretty much the only catalytically active residue is the lysine residue. Okay, now what's going to happen is those electrons that were accepted by the nitrogen of the pyridoxal phosphate ring are going to be spit back out, okay? And we're going to reform aromaticity, okay? And what's going to happen is these pi electrons are going to kick in here, and then these are going to come out and ultimately abstract the proton from the lysine, okay? Regenerating deprotonated lysine. And now what we have is a prime target for lysine nucleophilic attack, and that's what's going to happen. So what we're going to see now effectively is a reversal of the initial two steps. So what we saw in the initial two steps of the mechanism were um, the free amino acid amine attacked the shift base, and that eliminated the lysine residue, right? But in these steps, 
the lysine is going to do the nucleophilic attack and we're going to eliminate a free amino acid okay so mechanistically it's going to be identical it's just the identity of what we're eliminating that gets that gets changed okay so what's going to happen is this lysine is going to attack the shift base carbon and that's going to force these pi electrons to deprotonate the lysine okay and what that generates is this intermediate whereby the uh, pyridoxal phosphate is bound both to the what will be the free amino acid and the lysine residue. And what's going to happen now is we're going to get the elimination. So we're going to get loss of a leaving group. So these electrons on the amine are, of the lysine residue are going to kick in here, and that's going to force the elimination of the amino acid, which will initially leave as the... Um, the alanine that has the amine in the deprotonated state but we know that once it leaves the active site right it's going to do a proton exchange with solution in which it's going to pick up a proton right so once it leaves the active site then it's going to pick up the proton from solution but initially from the mechanism it's actually going to be in the deprotonated state and what that does is it regenerates our pyridoxal phosphate which is in a shift based linkage ultimately to the lysine residue of the transaminase